So let's continue. So I have um, all right. Um, So if you have your project and if you have tests and if you say, um, is it big enough? Okay, and if you say uh, go test and if you say minus, if you say nothing, it will just test your uh, current folder and say whether your tests are passing or not, right? Uh, shouldn't it get on the other side? Yep. Um. Can you like click? On the back of the of the screens, yeah. Great. So if you just say go test, it will kind of say, OK, pass. All the tests which we have just passed correctly. So what you can do is you can say minus V, and then you have kind of a details of what tests we actually running and what tests are passing and how long they take. Uh, so it's a little bit more verbose uh, dump of, of the tests. But you can also say cover. And then if you say cover, uh, it calculates how much of the statements were uh, correctly covered by the test, right? So if I open the IntelliJ, uh, in, fa <laughs> in fact, I, I show you w without IntelliJ. So if I go, um, if I run the tests again, um, so OK, so if, if I say cover, it, it just does what, uh, what I just showed. It, it calculates the percentage. But you can say cover profile um, and store, uh, store the coverage profile in a file. So I'm, I'm storing the coverage profile in a file called coverage out. OK? Um, so I'm basically calling a go test minus cover profile equals coverage out. And if I do that, I again get uh, what I got with the cover, but I get a, a file back. So if I now ls everything, I have an extra file here, which is called coverage out. And now if I um, use the tool, which is the cover tool, and I say I want, I want the HTML rendering of the coverage out file, what I will get is I will get in a browser, um, I will get my source code annotated and everything that is not covered by test is red and everything that is covered by test is green. So if I go to main, I see that my hello world handler is not covered by tests and my main function is not covered by tests, right? But if I go to uh, students go, everything that I wrote is in green. And then if I go to the API, all my logic is, is green as well, right? Um, so I have 100% coverage in those two files and 0% coverage in the main. And on average, that means I have 75% coverage. So that's what the, um, you know, this, this line says. So the requirement for your assignment is that you should have at least 
percent coverage, which means you just have to have like one or two tests, <coughs> right, to test something. Uh, Twenty percent is pretty straightforward to to reach, and what it would mean is that twenty percent of your source code is touched by this test when they run. Does it make sense? Why we do that? Why we write tests in general? Yeah. To confirm behavior. Yeah. So with the tests, you can uh, predict failing tests or passing tests to confirm that it does what you want. Exactly. So we're verifying that what we written is doing what we expect it to do. And we can catch some problems or some bugs early on. It also allows you, when you're working in a team, to make sure that people don't break each other functionality. So if I'm adding some functionality into a project, I usually commit my functionality with my tests and then I make sure that the test tests my functionality and then if somebody else adds some new functionality they will check if their new functionality doesn't break my functionality so we do so called regression testing where we run those tests every single time before we commit to the repository to make sure that we don't have any residual problems or uh, conflicts between the versions. Yeah? How do you get the cover profile uh, option? How did I get the cover profile option? Uh, is it standard? It's standard, yes. So go test minus cover profile equals whatever name you want for a file. I just named it coverage out, but you can name the file whatever you like. And then once you have this file, then you call it with the go tool cover and say minus HTML coverage. If you're using IDE, you can have the same happening in, in IDE, right? So how many of you are using IntelliJ? Uh, some of you are using. What, what the others are using? Atom? Um, yeah? Space Max. Use whatever suits you, right? And check if you can have the uh, test coverage data visualized. It's super useful uh, because it kind of shows you what is not yet covered by the tests, right? So if I open my IntelliJ, uh, I can show those of you who are using IntelliJ how, how it is done. Uh, with the other IDEs, yeah, you just have to check. So, in my ID, um, yeah, we will have the font problem again. <coughs> so let's go editor font. Uh, Marius, by yep. the way, um, yep. I don't think uh, Linux supports. Uh, Standard IntelliJ ID, you need like Gogland. So okay. Yeah, because I, I tried, but uh, I can't get uh, uh, go on uh, Linux based uh, IntelliJ ID. But you have the ultimate or you have the community one? I have the ultimate thing. Okay. Um, <coughs> right, so I have my uh, code base here. Um, yeah, let's change the resolution, maybe. So arrangement is mirrored and I want, yeah, let's try that. Um, so I configured the test uh, using the configuration menu. Uh, I showed it on the video as well. And then if I run the tests, I have you know all the tests kind of showing up here, and I have my coverage data. And if I go to analyze and I say show me the coverage data, and I pick that coverage out which I just generated, then what I end up I have this extra menu here where I can go to a particular file. And then in that file, uh, it shows me here by this green tint that this function is fully covered by tests. 
and this function is fully covered by test and so on. There is this kind of a uh, green hue, right? But if I go to main, I have the red hue. So it shows me, okay, this function is not covered by tests. So I would write, I would need to write a uh, short test to make sure that this part is covered as well, right? Um, so then I can go to my testing um, um, unit testing file and add a test which would touch this file. Like we actually in the project we're not testing the hello world kind of thing. Uh, so I would need to write an extra test which tests that the hello world works, and then this would be become green. Um, so you can use it. You, you can use the IDE or you can use this uh, command line um, setup with the uh, go tool cover and with the go test cover profile and then you will get the the number but the number is not as useful as actually seeing which code is being tested and which isn't right I mean that's the main 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 point um, <laughs> alright so it took me a, a approximately four hours to make the entire assignment one from scratch with a little bit of learning because I didn't know the GitHub API. I mean, I had to like read which calls to make and so on. So it took me uh, yeah, approximately four hours with a bit of learning. If I were to redo it again from scratch, it would probably take me less than two. Uh, but it is a little bit of work. You, you have to code a little bit. Uh, it's not something you can do, you know, in 10 lines of code. Uh, you need to declare your data structures, you need to make the calls, you need to parse the JSON and uh, package it up and then send the response. And while you're doing it, as I said, you should have small tests where you're testing the functionality uh, and you, you know, store your temporary JSON files in a file. So you're adding a little bit of extra coding for doing all the tests before you have everything done. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you... Uh, reasonably fast, you should expect, you know, approximately, I don't know, six, seven hours maybe. Uh, if you slower, then a little bit longer, and if you faster, then a little bit slower. But um, yeah, it's not trivial. It's not like you know, twenty minutes task. It's it's a little bit of coding that needs to go in. Um, right. We will also test the the quality of your code. So besides testing the actual code, uh, we will run, um, you know, go lint, right? For example, and it has to pass. You can try, you can go to your current version of your code and run go lint and check what issues do you have. If you have issues, you have to fix them. Um, and we will go, we will run the t coverage to check if you're reaching the 20%. Um, and we, you know, you should run go vet too to make sure that you have everything kind of uh, vetted um, in, your, in your code. And we then run the actual functionality. We will kind of test if it behaves how it should. And we will test some border cases. So, Sometimes um, the URL might be malformed. Uh, your program shouldn't crash. It should respond with something reasonable. Um, if the language for the repo, like, you know, you ask for the languages, but some repos don't report anything. They send you an empty JSON. Uh, you should not crash with that neither. Uh, some repos send you an empty contributor list. Uh, you should not crash with that neither, right? You should have some kind of uh, behavior for the border cases where you don't get what you expect to get, but you still need to respond, right? So if your app crashes, uh, that's bad. If your app doesn't respond with the proper thing, with the proper JSON back, that's bad. But if you cannot get all the data, you should respond with the JSON and some appropriate error code, right? Uh, so how you deal with those er erroneous conditions is up to you, but you should not crash. That's the message. Uh, yeah, any questions? <coughs> yep. We don't pass, we get another chance. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So there is, um, 
we kind of developing like a <coughs> submission system. So we should be able to open it before the deadline. Uh, and then you can submit, it will check if you're passing and then it will tell you and if you're not passing it will tell you what you're missing and then you can resubmit. Uh, we have to agree it with Chris what we do after the deadline. It has some fundamental issue though, right? So yeah. Because um, you, the rate limit of GitHub will eventually catch up with us. Because if you yeah, that's right. deploy the app, most likely you will not get a response and we need to delay that and do it. Yeah, but we, we yeah. So I was thinking about it, but we will be asking them to do the query, right? Yeah, but then they hit the rate limiter huh? because we we're coming from a. Yes, I know, but so that. usually it works like this: they kind of submit to us, yeah. they report, they um, they deployed service. Yeah. We ask them. Yeah. They ask GitHub. Yeah. It goes back. We tell them, okay, that's what's right and that's what's wrong. Yeah. And then they have time to fix it. Yeah. But this student will not be interrogated again. In a in a while, no, 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 it will be a different. But if if they are all deploying on whatever they are deploying, and we constantly have the queries to the same um, uh, GitHub repo, most likely will hit into rate limit. Yeah, maybe. So if if we hit we some some limits, we will see. Yeah, we may need to fix it. Yeah. Another thing with that is that uh, we should support concurrency. Uh, so how hard will you test it? And yeah, that's right. So the requirement says that you should support concurrency, but it is kind of given because you all using the built-in uh, HTTP server. It does support concurrency out of the box. So you actually don't need to do anything special, right? It does allow you to it uh, it does allow us to query you multiple times and it will kind of work without you doing anything special. Uh so for this assignment in a way it's like um no extra work needed, yeah. And it will be concurrent by definition. Okay, so, um, yes, I do encourage you to watch the videos. Uh, they do go <laughs> slower through some of the topics about the testing. Uh, if there is a topic that you still need us to discuss more in more detail, we will. Uh, there are two, um, smallish topics that I will cover today. So the first one is how do you parse um, JSON uh, in a form of, um, so if I go, yeah, let me check. So if I go, Right, so I have my test data for languages, and it looks like this, right? Um, how have anyone already did that? Parsing the the JSON structure like this? Who who has done it already? No, successfully parsed that structure. Okay, so how did you do that? Over HTTP. Yeah, so over HTTP you're getting this back, and then how do you parsing it? <coughs> yeah? Using the built in language support for JSON parsing into your struct. And what, what this struct is? What is that struct? Because here you have keys which are dynamic. Um, a map. Exactly. So, so you're parsing it into a map, and how did you declare it? How you did did you declare this parsing? So, so normally in in um, um, yeah, let me just check. So, if I go. So if I go to my, let's say, API. Um, yeah, 
job. So for example here, I get a body um, which has an array of student records, right? And I declared what student is, and the student is, you know, this um, this. So I have name, age, and ID, and name, age, and ID, right? So if I go to this point, um, So then I, I'm instructing, okay, please the go JSON framework, package up what's side inside the body into A, and A happened to be an array of students. But this here um, is not, um, it's dynamic. It's just uh, key value pairs. There is no structure to it, right? It's just uh, a you know a number of things which map the key to value. Uh, so to parse that, I cannot create a struct which has something, some key which I know of, because all those keys are kind of new, like they kind of dynamically created. So to to parse that correctly, what I need to do is I need to pass something here which is of dynamic nature, right? So in my case, in here, that would be, I have A, and what type that would be? Yeah, and in fact, it, it is just interface. Right? That's how you did it? You could, you could, you could say it's a map um, of string into the interface with int. It will not work. So because um, so I've done it like like this will work, and this will work as well. And then type of A will turn up to be a map of strings into the interface. The problem it doesn't work with int is because um, when this happens, some of those keys um, like exceed the potentially exceed the limit of int. So while the parser is parsing the inputs, it doesn't know what the type is. It is kind of inferred later. So if you declare it as int, then it will say, actually, I don't know if it's int, I will skip it. I, 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 I will not do the mapping, right? Uh, in our case, we don't care about those values anyway. We only care about the keys of the map, right? We disregard the how big the languages are. We only need to extract the, the languages. So you can, you can do this or you can do this. Um, oops and it will work. If you do int, it may happen to work if it just happened to you that you got the language list which has like small numbers on the right hand <coughs> side. Uh, but for that particular file, I tried int and it was telling me the map is really between strings and the interface. If you get into trouble, then, uh, you know, we can discuss it. Uh, but you need to know a little bit about this type, the interface type, that it is kind of like a, yeah, with C++ you don't actually have that, right? So those of you who know Java, it's kind of like object. Uh, those of you who know other object-oriented languages, you usually have like a common type which everything else is based on. Um, C++ is a little bit weird because you kind of don't really have that. You don't uh, need that. Um, 
but in Go this type is like interface. It's like a um, it's like a type which can <coughs> substitute any other type, right? Um, I can say um, A is interface, right? And then I can like how would I use it? Like I don't know what type it is, right? So then you have this type inference. So what you can say is I you you can say I need a real A which is taken from A and then you pass the type here. Then I can say it's actually a is a map uh, between strings and ints, right? And if this line succeeds, I get OK, which is true. And I will get RA, which is the same as A, but now it's of this type. So I can cast, it's like type casting in C++. I can cast a particular variable to a different variable with a particular type. And if the casting fails, I get you know, false in the OK. And if it succeeds, I get uh, boolean true and ra now is I can use ra as a map so I can say uh, give me you know something I, I have some key value you know uh, map as this type suggests uh, but I cannot do that on a I cannot say a you know something I cannot do that because a is not a map a is just interface it's a type which you have no knowledge about right an interface doesn't have any methods. It, it, you cannot really do anything with it. You can only cast it to something that has a known type. Does it make sense? So you, in, in case of this file, we actually don't care what type it is on the right-hand side, because we're not using it anyway. We're only using the keys, right? So I actually don't care if I cast it to int or if I cast it to interface um, brackets. The only thing I care is that this succeeds, and then I can say, uh, get me all the keys, uh, and I don't care about the value from the range of array, right? And do something with the keys, because I need to package them into the array uh, to send back that this um, project uses all those languages. This is, uh, by the way, uh, redundant, so you really need that. Um, um, yeah, there was one comment uh, before about the mismatch between projects and repos. Um, and in, in unfortunately, in the specification for the assignment, we use the word project where we actually meant a repo, <laughs> right? So unfortunately, uh, if you go to the specification, it, it, uh, like in the, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go to Blackboard, but it has this JSON thing, and it has the field called project, uh, which in fact is the name of the repo. <laughs> so you know it should be called repo or uh, repository, not project, but it's historically with a bug. So just use what's there, because that's how we coded the testing. Uh, you have to use the word project there. But semantically, it means a repository. Um, so that, that bit was a little bit confusing, because the REST API for GitHub distinguishes between the projects and the repositories. And what we after, we are after the stats for the repository, not for the project. Um, OK. Any other questions about this um, parsing of the unstructured JSON? Normally, JSON is structured, and we um, we plan the structure of what we want to parse, like we're doing here with the student, right? We know it will be a structured document. It will have pa particular keys with particular values, and we can predict that. But in this particular case, we have no idea what keys we will get. So it's kind of like it is a correct JSON. It's just that it is unstructured. We cannot plan what it will have inside. That's why we use interface. OK, so that was one. <coughs> and then the second thing is um, it will be pretty tough with the display. Let me check if I can change the resolution even more, even smaller. Um, this is pretty limited. Ah, yeah, that, that might do. 
Okay, let's try that. So if I close that and open the So there was a question about debugging. Um, so let's open a project. Um, so there are two answers to, to debugging. One answer is that debugging is like with everything else, like it's with C++, it's easy. You just have the IDE, which kind of uh, allows you to do debugging with your code. Uh, so I can set a breakpoint. I can say, OK, I want to. Uh, make sure that the hello world works correctly. I set up a breakpoint and then I say uh, main and run with the debugger and then it basically fires up the instrumentation layer which attaches to my process, asks me for permissions to are you allowing you know this process to mess up with the other process. Um, yes, I allow. And then it basically runs the the code. Uh, and now if I go to the <coughs> so if I go to hello world, so localhost hello world was on the hello. Um, then I'm here, right? And I, I see all the variables, I see the parts. Uh, so currently parts are not in initiated yet. So I can kind of uh, step through. Now parts is an array, the first part is empty, then I have hello, then the, the last part is empty, <coughs> because we've discovered that, that it kind of uh, parses from the, from the slash, uh, and then anything to the left is like empty string, then I have hello, and then it uses the like trailing slash with the empty at the end, so that's why I have three, va three values here. Um, and it's like debugging like with every other language, right? You just step through, see the variables, inspect it, go in, go out, you know. Have you done debugging with C++? Yeah, with Visual Studio? So it's pretty much the same. So what's so much fuss about debugging with Go? <laughs> well, the fuss is that Go is a highly concurrent language. I can have you know, thousands or millions of Go routines concurrently doing so something. And then none of the existing debuggers really works well with the concurrent progr programs, right? That's super hard. If I have sequential functions like this, uh, I don't have much of a problem, um, you know, debugging this. Uh, but as soon as I move in um, to more concurrent execution, and I have multiple things happening, I cannot easily do this kind of debugging. So what do you do then? Um, how do you debug your code if you cannot really use the debugger? So how do you debug your code normally if you're not using a debugger? Yep, so writing tests is one way. So you write some tests, and then the test will kind <coughs> of uh, fail if something is not uh, behaving the way you expect. So you write some piece of code, and <coughs> then you have some assertions. So you know you say, get me this, and then I expect <coughs> this to come back, right? Uh, or something <coughs> like this. So writing tests is, is perfect and, and strongly encouraged. The other thing which you do more often is you just put some print, print lines write print statements into your code to see how far you got and where you, with your variables, to, to just have a little bit of an insight of where the execution is currently happening, right? So with concurrent code, with uh, highly parallelized uh, Go routines, um, the kind of, the, yes, there are some tools, and they even Go has built in tools for uh, <coughs> investigating race conditions, for example. But at the end of the day, you kind of back into logging, right? So you have to log certain events, and you should use some logging framework which allows you to have structured uh, entries with the context attached to it. So you can do some filtering on it, and you 
basically your debugging is based on analyzing the flows of your log files um, there is no um, like a solution to that uh, so if your code is relatively simple and you're testing some complex but sequential execution the built-in debugger uh, with your IDE or the, the one which comes with Go is, is perfect the IDEs are quite nice because they annotate your code so now for example parts is known so the ID annotates for me that the length of parts is 3 and capacity is 3 it kind of tells me more insights so the more I go uh, the more I will learn so the currently the status is unknown it's just some you know random value uh, and then what will happen because it's a piece of memory with some randomness there right it's just rubbish and then if I do the next line okay suddenly it got uh, into 400 because I've executed the assignment right uh, so I can uh, have annotations and I also can inspect the, the variables here check <coughs> different functions like you know this function is calling this function and this function is calling this that's where I am currently um, it's easy <coughs> like it's the same as with with uh, C++ or with C um, there is no no problem the problem starts when you have um, you know concurrent execution um, then this tool First of all, it really slows down the programs. And second of all, you can't really keep track of multiple concurrent things at the same time. Uh, you have to let the system run, and you have to log the events and the timing, so then you can analyze what is not right afterwards. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say about uh, debugging. Um, I usually don't use the debugger because um, I try for everything that is a little bit more complex to write a test case and make sure that this little bit of complex logic I've already tested. Um, so I usually don't have a situation where I don't know why something behaves certain way. Um, but well, you you may you may want to do that. Like sometimes uh, there are some. Uh, Go specific data structures, which are like nested uh, slices or something, and you want to see like okay how they are organized. So using a debugger is kind of useful. Um, I'm usually a bit lazy, and the, uh, you you know uh, even firing up the debugger takes a little bit of time. So usually I just write a print print line statement to check what's inside uh, if I just need to know. Uh, and for like more thorough debugging, I try to avoid it and I try to write tests instead. Uh, so I try to substitute debugging sessions with writing tests. Tests are much more useful, they are persistent, you can always run them over and over if you're adding new functionality. You know, debugging is tedious, time consuming, and at the end of debugging, you have nothing new. Like, you just fix something or you understood some, you know, something that was not working, but, you know, you ha will have to repeat it the next time something happens. Uh, with tests, tests are reusable. They stay in the code base forever, so write tests. They are pretty lightweight in Go. You have the tooling, um, so there is no reason not to do it. You don't need to install any fancy frameworks or anything. It's already built in. So, <coughs> yep, so that's all I have to say. Um, mm, yeah, once we have the submission system, we will post it on the Blackboard. Um, I posted the video for the final part of the tutorial on Blackboard already, and I posted a, an additional video uh, in week three for some of the tooling. Um, some of you might be a little bit ahead, and if you are interested, you can check, for example, how many requests per second your implementation for the assignment one is doing. It's not part of the assignment, but you may just want to know how many requests can I handle. Do I handle, you know, 500 requests per second or two, right? Uh, so you can time what takes long. Of course, asking GitHub for data will take the longest because it's I.O., it's something out of your control, right? Uh, so that part takes the longest, and then you, re you get the response back. But what you do logically on your site, you can optimize. So if you're using regular expressions or if you're doing a split string or whatever has influence of how fast are you dealing with, uh, with requests, 
and you can watch the tooling video, it's like 40 minutes, and the guy kind of goes from very simple things to more performance-oriented kind of uh, workload testing. And it's super easy uh, with Go and, and super nice, and you can <coughs> kind of uh, uh, push uh, some workload on your API and see what are the limits. You know, you wrote a hello world thing, how many hello world messages per second can your laptop do with the built-in web server, right? And why, and how can you improve it? What is the slowest part? Um, so he goes into some of the details and, for example, not specifying the uh, content type for the output turns out to be quite time consuming because Go framework has to work out what it should do based on what you're pushing into the pipe, right? So when you start writing your response, Go is trying to figure out, is it JSON or is it plain text or is it HTML? And then sets the content type. But that actually takes a lot of time because of the analysis it has to do on the buffers. If you say, my output is application JSON, then you suddenly speed up your processing by a huge margin because this part of logic doesn't have to happen. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't use some of the tooling, right? Um, so in week three, there is additional video for the tooling. 40 minutes, I encourage you to check it. Uh, the first part is very easy, fundamental stuff, and then you already know most of it. And then the second half is kind of uh, more about performance optimizations. And then for week four, we have the, um, yeah, the video for the testing. Um, it turned out to be a, a quite long, actually. So I thought it will be shorter than usual, but um, yeah, there was quite a lot of uh, logic that has to go in, so it, it came up to be two hours. So that's the week four, and then in week five, we kind of just spending some time on making sure everybody will do assignment one. If you don't do assignment one, you may say, well, you know, I just don't have this 10% and I just don't do it. Um, but you will kind of shoot yourself in the foot because assignment two requires a lot of stuff that you do for assignment one. So you would effectively have to do assignment one again for assignment two without reaping the benefits of getting that 10%, right? So I strongly encourage everybody to do assignment one uh, because you will have to do it anyway for assignment two. Uh, it's kind of like, it's not really a prerequisite, but a lot of stuff that we're doing for assignment two is based on what you've done in assignment one. Um, so like even if you don't submit it, you will have to learn it and do it for assignment two to work, right? So if you don't do assignment one, it will be really hard to do assignment two and you will have to catch up anyway. Um, we will try to open up the submission system early so you get feedback, but as we were discussing, we may have some uh, GitHub API threshold problems, we will see. Um, and we haven't finished it yet, so yeah. We will see how long it takes. So so now <coughs> let's have um, Let's have a 10 minutes break, and after the break, we will do a Q&A. So if you have any problems or any questions or you, don't, you got stuck, then we are here to, to help you out. All right? Uh, when you log in to...